I'm getting this video out a little bit later than I wanted, and I apologize for that. Uh, but it is going to be on the shorter side, so that's a that's a good thing. So um, we're covering section 5.3, which is on recursion, 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 recursion. And that's a very bad joke that um, you'll get if you've seen recursion before, and if not, you'll get it uh, in just a few minutes. So let's, uh, let's just jump right in. So we're primarily concerned with uh, what are called recursively defined functions in this section. At the very end of the video, we're going to look at a couple of um, recursive algorithms. But the way that you define a function recursively um, is in two steps, and they're very, very similar to what we were doing with induction. Um, first of all, note that they that re these recursively defined functions are going to take the non-negative integers as a domain, or sometimes um, a subset of those guys. Sometimes uh, it'll be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Sometimes it'll be 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So you need to be a little bit flexible with that definition, or with, with what that says right there. So to define um, a function recursively, you start out with a basis step, and that's when you specify the value of the function at zero. Um, or, you know, if, if, if zero isn't where you want to start, um, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll start at one, you know, or you'll, your basis step will define it at one um, or two, you know, etc. Uh, you don't always have to start your uh, function at, at one, uh, but usually you will, uh, excuse me, at zero, but usually you will. And then after you have your basis step, you have what's called the recursive step. And that's where you give a rule for finding the value of the function um, in terms of smaller values. So let's just jump right into this example down here. So I'm starting out with my basis step. f of zero is defined to be two. And then my um, recursive step, I give values for the function in terms of uh, lower input. So f of n plus 1 is going to be 3 times f of n plus 1. And this definition is going to be valid here for, uh, this is going to be for n greater than 0. That's how the function will be defined. And so what we usually want to do um, when we're looking at these functions is just look at what, you know, some of the first couple values are, just to see how this works. So let's do that. Um, f of 0 is defined in the basis step to be 2. f of 1 is going to be... Now this is where we look at the recursive step. So f of 1 is going to be 3 times f of 0 plus 1. Why? Well, the reason is, um, look at the recursive step. f of n plus 1 is 3 times f of n plus 1. So here, my n plus 1 is 1. That's what I'm inputting. And so if n plus 1 is 1, n is going to be 0. And so that means we can define the function or we, we, we can see what f of 1 is. It's going to be 3 times whatever f of 0 was, but that was 2, plus 1, and that's going to give us 7. Um, f of 2 is equal to 3 times f of 1, plus 1, but f of 1 was 7, so this is 3 times 7 plus 1, and so we'll get 22. Uh, you know, we, we can keep going. f of 3 is 3 times f of 2 plus 1, so that's going to give us 3 times 22 plus 1, and I'm running out of room, but that's going to be 67. So notice, um, in order to get the uh, value of a function at a certain integer, I have to know the value of the function at the previous integer. Okay, I, I couldn't just jump right in and tell you what f of 3 is, because to tell you what f of 3 is, I have to know what f of 2 is. To know what f of 2 is, I have to know what f of 1 is. To know what f of 1 is, I have to know what f of 0 is. So that's what a recursively defined function does. 
you define the function in terms of things that came before it. So you have to do all this calculation, uh, excuse me, you have to do all of the previous calculations to build up to whichever one you want to calculate. You can't just jump in and say, okay, f of 100 is going to be whatever. Um, if you only have a recursive definition for your function, you have to do, to do f of 100, I need to know f of 99. But to do that, I need to know f of 98, and, and, and so on and so forth. And that's how recursive functions work. Okay, just a, a brief thing about notation. Um, sometimes we'll use this f of n notation, um, where the function will be defined, like the previous example, f of 0 was 2, f of n plus 1 was going to be 3 times f of n plus 1, um, where n was greater than 0. Now, um, sometimes we can, def we can give um, these recursive functions as sequences. That is, we'll define a number a0 to be 2, and then a of n plus 1 could be 3 times a n plus 1. So we're not using function notation now, we're using sequence notation. But really, the, it's the exact same thing happening. Nothing, nothing new is, is, is uh, going on. So let's just look at a couple of examples and compare the two different notations. So in the function notation, we have f of 0, which is 2. And in the sequence notation, we have a sub 0, which is defined to be 2. So in, in the function notation, we have f of 1, which is 3 times f of 0 plus 1, which we saw before was 7. And then in the sequence notation, we would have a1, is equal to 3 times a0 plus 1. And that's because of the way the sequence is defined, right? A0 a is 2, and then a n plus 1 was 3 times a n plus 1. So a1 would be 3 times a0 plus 1. And so when you calculate that out, uh, it's, it's, it's exactly like when you use function notation. 3 times the value of a0, which was 2, plus 1, which, you know, will give you 7. Um, f of 2, going back to the function notation, is 3 times f of 1, plus 1, but that's 22. And then in the sequence notation, a sub 2 would be 3 times a sub 1, plus 1, a sub 1 was 7, and so we're going to get 22. So, you know, they're equivalent. Uh, sometimes you'll use the function notation, sometimes you'll use the sequence notation. It just depends on, on the, the context of the problem and what your goal is. So I just want you to uh, be aware of that. So now let's look at an example where um, it's just given, um, just given in, in sequence notation. So in this example, <clears throat> um, notice here we're, we're starting at, at 1. So our um, basis step tells us that a1 is equal to 1. And then the recursive step says that a n plus 1 is going to be 1 over n plus 1 plus a n. Okay, so let's, let's see what happens if we try to list out some of the, um, some of the terms of this recursively given sequence. So a1 is equal to 1. a2 is going to be 1 over 2 plus a1. Okay, so why? Let's, let's, uh, oh yeah, and this is going to be equal to 1 over 2 plus a1, which was 1. Okay, so wh wh where did that come from? Wh wh where did this 2 come from? Look, I actually used my index as part of the uh, the equation. So a n plus 1 is 1 over n plus 1 plus the previous term of my sequence. So let's see what a3 would look like. a3 is 1 over 3 plus a2, that is... 1 over 3 plus 1 half 
plus 1. Okay. And maybe now you can see what the uh, general pattern is, is, is going to be. But let's, let's do a couple more. A 4 is going to be 1 over 4 plus a 3. So that's 1 over 4 plus, so look back at what a 3 was. It was 1 over 3 plus 1 over 2 plus 1. Now this is a nice case where you can see what the pattern is and you, you are able to, to jump in and say, oh, well, I know what a of 100 is going to be. Um, it's just going to be, you know, 1 over 100 plus 1 over 99, et cetera, et cetera. So you notice this pattern. That doesn't always happen, but when, when it does, you know, go ahead and use it. Um, so there you go. 3. Okay, here's probably the, the most famous um, recursively defined um, function out there, and it's called the, the Fibonacci sequence. Um, and it is defined, um, the, th this one is special for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, it shows up in nature everywhere. And also, the, the basis step here has, has two parts. Okay, here, here's the basis step. I define the function at zero, f of zero is equal to zero. I define the function at one, f of one is equal to one. And then I use both of these to define the, um, the values of my function for higher integers. So f of n is going to be f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2 whenever n is greater than 1. So let's see what some of the terms of the Fibonacci sequence look like. Part of the basis is that the basis step is that f of 0 is equal to 0, f of 1 is equal to 1, and then f of 2. This is when we um, use the, the recursive definition. This is going to be equal to f of 1 plus f of 0. So we're going to get 1 plus 0 equals 1. What's f of 3? f of 3 is f of 2 plus f of 1. So we're going to get 1 plus 1 equals 2. Now, you know, notice what's going on. I'm always adding the uh, previous two, um, the previous two terms um, of my sequence that are showing up. So, I, you know, I don't even have to list to, 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 write, to write out, you know, the f of 2 plus f of 1. I know that f of 4 is going to be 2, because that was my previous term, plus 1, so I get 3. Okay, And so the way that you see the Fibonacci um, sequence usually given is uh, something like this. You know that it starts out at 0, and the next term is 1, and now to get every other term, you just add up the two previous ones. So zero, 0 plus 1 is 1, so that's the next term. 1 plus 1 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. 2 plus 3 is 5. 3 plus 5 is 8. 8 plus 5 is 13. And so on and so forth. Okay, so this is the Fibonacci sequence. And you can give it... Um, in terms of a recursively defined function, or uh, usually you'll see the terms of the sequence written out like this, where it's just understood that you always add the previous two terms to get the next one. Now, like I said a second ago, this shows up everywhere in nature, um, and to see that, I want, I want to show you a, uh, a, a picture. Here's what happens when we start tiling the plane with um, the terms of the Fibonacci sequence. We make little squares with the areas. So look right here, right here. I have a square with area 1. And right above it, I have a square with area 1. So that's my, um, that's my first term and my second term. And then I add those together, and I have a square of area 2. 
then 2 plus 1 is 3, so here is a square with area 3, and then so on and so forth. And I'm going to start rotating out with the values, um, with, excuse me, with the terms of the Fibonacci sequence. And I can make this spiral, you know, going around these corners of the Fibonacci sequence. This is called the, uh, the, the golden spiral. And it turns out that this shows up in nature um, a, a lot. Here are a couple of examples of, of, of where it shows up in nature. Um, you know, sunflowers, the, the, that golden spiral shows up in there. Whatever this thing is, I have no idea. These, these uh, shells of this animal. Um, spirals of galaxies. Here's that original picture. Some more flower stuff. Um, DNA helices. Uh, weather patterns. You know, it's you, you can fall into a fun little rabbit hole if you, if you Google um, Fibonacci sequence in nature and find all of these examples, or find all kinds of examples where it shows up in nature like this. And then finally, we have a couple of um, recursively given algorithms. I'm not going to say too much about these. Um, this this is a great opportunity for you all to kind of work through the algorithms, um, you know, with some with some actual examples. And you, you know, you've probably went far enough in your programming classes that you can actually write some of these and um, and, and and make them work. The first one is a recursive algorithm for computing factorial. So here it is. A procedure, I'm just going to call it factorial. The input is n, which is a non-negative integer. And the algorithm works. It's really super simple. If n is equal to 0, then immediately return 1. Um, you know, because we know that 0 factorial is just defined to be 1. Else, you know, if, if n is something other than 1, then you're going to return n multiplied by the factorial of n minus 1. So think about what this algorithm is going to do. In order to get factorial n minus 1, okay, it's going to have to kind of run itself. Um, and if, you know, it, it runs through this, this loop again. Um, you know, and, and if n minus 1 gets us to 0, then that'll be 1 times n, but if, it, if not, then it, you know, it, it'll run factorial n minus 1 again. So that sounds kind of weird because it, it, this is recursion. It keeps calling back to itself over and over and over. Think about the, the first picture on the, on, on the first slide. Um, so you know, try this. Tr try following the, these directions and calculate like factorial 5 or 5 factorial or 6 factorial or you know, something like that. Uh, and, then, and then try to, you know, Input this in Java or Python or, you know, whatever. Another one is, is a recursive algorithm for computing a raised to the n power. And it's, it's very, very similar. So procedure power um, input is a, which is a non-zero real number. The second input is n, which is a non-negative integer. If n is equal to zero, then just return one, because any non-zero number raised to the zero power is one. Otherwise, you're going to return a multiplied by power a comma n minus 1. So I want you to think about what this is doing. Okay, what is a times power a comma n minus 1? You know, do this for like, um, you know, 2 to the third power or, you know, 5 to the third power or some, something like that. Don't, don't, don't go crazy with your with your a's or with your um, exponents. Otherwise, um, you know, the calculations will get, but by hand will get, will get, you know, kind of, kind of complicated. But just try this and see what happens. And then, you know, then tr maybe try making a, a, a program that, that does this. Um, and, and that's all for this section. That's all that I have.